I don't know that we're going to need a school building in eight years. I, in fact, I'm fairly sure we won't. But nonetheless, um, this is forward planning. So um, we're going to start. And um, shortly, uh, we'll have a new staff here. We'll have a new superintendent and, and a new business manager, I believe. And they will lead the process. But um, Gene Taylor and I will be um, working together on, on this program. And what are we going to do? Well, we're going to do all those things, and I'm just not going to assume that you don't. Can you see? I was going to say, I figure you all can read, so I'm not going to read that, but just let you know that um, I've had a couple of conversations with Jeff Parker from SHP, and they are going to uh, work with us on this as an advanced planning project. Um, and I did ask to, for a commitment to that, so. We have that, and Jeff would be here tonight, except um, I think he's on a cruise ship, so I, I, I go to where he went. Um, we are doing basically the same thing we did before. We're going to set up a new um, community committee, community district joint committee, and we will um, work this with the community and try to project out what we're going to need when, and if we're lucky or persistent, I hope we can do it to build out so that we don't have to do that part again we'll have a plan. And this is not about a bond issue. You, know, you never know who you're going to have in the audience, so I threw this in because I just didn't want anyone to think that we were talking about a bond issue. Of course, we'll need one if we need to and some facilities, but that's a long way away from now. So we are doing smart planning as far as I'm And the bottom line chart. There we go. Um, we're just planning our future. Um, we're going to address all of our facility needs as they are right now, the numbers, um, what we're going to need. We've got projected planning as uh, planning advocates does for us every two years um, that go out. And if you look at it, the, um, the middle line right now doesn't look too bad. But if anything happens to cause us to go to the high line in a hurry, it would be a good thing that we plan. So um, the reality is we can't stop the growth, but we sure can plan for it. So that was my informational presentation, just to make sure everybody knows we're good. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll be around if anybody's got any questions. Mr. Morrison asked whether we had enrollment projections for planning advocates. We just received those. Yeah. Okay. And um, I passed them on to Darren and actually we spent part of the day looking at enrollment projections, so we haven't had a chance to digest those yet, they'll be coming the way. Uh, the growth bubble initially on initial look is not as steep currently as we would think, but it only goes out so many years based on the data it has today. So the process, and, and as you know, Mr. Morrison and Mr. Taylor and uh, Mrs. Arnold, you, you realize that the planning, you know, we've been fortunate here in three new buildings in the last four years, and uh, the experience that, that I've had with is so refined. Process is long. Generally, it's a year to design and to build that the planning goes before the design to find the right location, what it's going to look like, redistricting if you need it. So it's a lengthy process to do. So pre planning comes into play. The more you plan, the better the project goes. Thank you. I have a question somewhat related to that. Uh, in terms of redistricting, I know when Coy and Trey went out, we can be redistricted to allocate children. And I know that certain schools maybe have a little bit of a over, over abundance of kids now. Is that something we're looking at? For? I think that as we look at the housing starts that come through off of the river, right now the only two buildings that are really out of whack so much would be the middle schools. And it is about 200, 250 kids less than Coy, but Coy was designed to house 1,100 students, so they're still under capacity, and Angie is under capacity. Right now, without doing the math, I would say all of your buildings are at least 90 to 93 percent capacity, which is, is, is really a positive thing. But if the district chooses in a couple years to move through this process to look at redistricting, to balance out 
the anchor you employ would probably involve splitting neighborhoods. And that's a very difficult thing to do throughout the future. But it's not to the point right now that it's causing major problems with staffing issues because we've pretty much gotten away from shared staffing and each building has its own physical education teacher, our teacher, and music teacher. So we're not doing the share as much as we have in the past. But when the district gets to redistricting, you may want to look at your middle schools. Well, I think everybody can agree that we need to never, ever, ever let that high school get in the condition that it was in the population homes that we did before. This is just, you know, like what anything we did it was just, you know, they moved all over the place. Thank you, Mrs. Arnold. A second on presentation is Dr. Susan Hayward. She's going to present a, an update on the straight A grants that she's in the process of writing. The application process is still open. We're not closed until Wednesday, May 5th, I believe. Um, so this is a broad scope, broad painting of what's going on as we move through round four of straight A grant, straight A grant writing. We have watched her and her team up many days back in conference room writing. So this time she has a brief overview of the grants that we're pursuing. Good evening. I would like to give you a brief um, presentation on straight A grant round four. Currently we are in the middle of the grant writing process. It's very competitive. Beginning tomorrow, we will begin entering the answers to the application questions into the ODE system. Um, due to the competitive nature of the grants, there are over 610 districts that are competing for those grants. I'm going to be brief and refer to my script. Um, I know Brian's going to probably post this board meeting on Facebook tomorrow and other districts could see that and I do not want anyone to steal our ideas. So, grant one, learning comments. Oh, hold on. So yeah, thanks for focusing on that process right there. I think for some people it's, it's unclear exactly how this process works. And, uh, the immediacy of the information that comes from this type of this type of work. Sure. Thank you. I'm um, grant one. We are submitting three grants, and we are possibly submitting a fourth grant. Um, we are in really good shape in the grant writing process, and I'm going to talk about grant one, two, and three and there is a possibility of writing a fourth grant. Um, grant one is titled um, around the topic of learning commons. This grant will create a countywide collaboration for innovative use of library space, both in one location as well as a global learning space. It is based on guiding research around creating a learning commons made relevant by the Canada Library Association. We have reached out to all districts within the county for this initiative and are also collaborating with the Green County Public Library. This is similar to a grant we previously submitted in round three, but contains creative and innovative additions that will set this grant apart from all other grants submitted to the Ohio Department of Education. Grant two is um, STEMJET. This grant will create a regional STEMJET learning experience for K-12 students. It will include the development of the aerospace curricular program, featuring grade level units of study to support on-site and virtual experiences within the STEM JET. Collaborative partnerships have been established with area businesses and educational institutions and the area districts that have been invited to join us in the creation of this curricular program. This grant will include costs associated with moving and remodeling the STEM JET as well as the creation of a specialized curriculum and the associated professional development to make it successful. What's truly special about this grant is that the activities that the students will be doing in the grant are not activities that can be done in a traditional classroom. So as districts experience this grant, it will really be focused on that learning space. Um, grant three is museum learning. This grant will introduce the museum learning model into all six elementary buildings. The concept is centered upon experiential learning theories and research that shows the benefit of infusing education with authentic learning and interactions with primary resources. Students will work in collaboration with partnering museums, 
and cultural institutions to learn how to research and create meaningful exhibits in response to problems. Similar to our previous submitted grant, our students will experience multiple guest speakers, interactive presentations, and go on learning expeditions, all directly linked to the Ohio Learning Standards and the Common Core Standards. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hayward. And as we move forward in the process, the um, application piece and then make it for their house has, has to be about that. The process that we takes quite a long time. We are not anticipating getting the results back from our application until approximately June 20th, I believe, which is the date we're planning on. So there's a period of time where we will not know whether we've been successful. But I want to thank Dr. Hayward and her team. I've stopped in several times in the conference room. And they're diligently working, and this is not a, an easy grant. This is a new grant. It's multiple pages, numerous pages. <coughs> a very competitive, but also with the benefit of the grant, there are a number of characters in each answer, so they have to be very succinct as they answer the questions and put the grant together. So it is a very complicated grant to write. And it's very aggressive on Dr. Hayward's part to write three. And now I just spoke to her today, and she's thinking of writing a fourth. I don't know what people don't realize either that they put in four hours or after hours at work on the weekend, and it's a volunteer status. Yeah. Well, so I, that's, I can attest to Dr. Hayward and her team, they're 24-7, 365. Not only do they come in early in the conference room, they stay late for the conference room, they work at weekends and evenings. I'm in the design lab today, yeah. observing, and, and I spoke to the um, students there and what they were expressing, not only was it creativity going on there, but collaborative learning. I mean, I said to them at one point, because we had questions, you know, what else did you learn besides, you know, this is thinking outside the box, and all of a sudden they went, oh, we learned to compromise with people, accept other ideas, even though they're not ours. And I mean, it was really interesting, and the leadership skills were coming out were amazing. So when I was thinking, Thank you for that grant because that design lab would not be there had it not been for the grant. So I thought about you today as I was sitting there thinking, thank you, Dr. Hayward, on behalf of those kids. Plus, I had a good time. That would have been my classroom, really, but okay. So thank you. So we're moving on. Um, yes, the approval of minutes held. So we have, I'm going to just put these on block. I'm going to need a motion in a second to approve the following March meetings. March 7, 9, 17, 21st, 22nd, 23rd, 17th was a regular board meeting. The rest were all the special meetings to the superintendent interviews. So um, I need a motion in a second to approve all of these meetings. So we need a discussion. Ms. Arnold? Yes. Mr. Taylor? Yes. Ms. Hunt? Yes. Mr. Morrison? Yes. Ms. Ravenna? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, we're on to financial report to request. And we're going to fund these, but then we'll talk about them separately. So we am going to need a motion and a second to approve the March 2016 financial report on page 15. The March 2016 donated items on page 31 and Fiscal year 16 amended certificate of estimated resources slash, slash appropriations on page 32. And the motion is set. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Sure. I would just like to say that again, we are in alignment with what we have been projecting throughout the year. Um, our real estate taxes are up about $967,891. And you know, throughout the first settlement, I wasn't exactly sure, you know, what that was for. I thought, well, you know, what Epson was, we'll see where it's at when we get our second settlement. And we've gotten that, and what's ended up happening is, and this will be evident in the five-year forecast next month as well, and in the notes to the forecast, our delinquent taxes are up $808,320 over last year. And so delinquent taxes, that's kind of a one-time um, money if, if we're collecting on that. but. That variance there that you see of that 967, 800 made up is a delinquent tax increase. And then 
we're up about 873,000 in our foundation program. I do think over the rest of the year that will level out a little bit. There's a couple of factors for why our state funding is up a little bit, but there's like 342 variables. So um, the the number of students that we have projected, we're we're, we're on target with our tuition and our and our students, but. Um, but um, the, all the different variables. So if you have a, little, a few less children than what you had anticipated or a few more, it can make you look poorer or richer in conjunction to the whole state. And so that will tweak some of those variables that even uh, in the second or third digit of a, of a decimal, and it'll bring you just a little bit more money in certain areas. So I mean, there's no, there's no real concrete way to explain it other than it's, it's a function of the, of the variables that we have in our district right now. And our, our assessed valuation and stuff was rising. So we'll, we'll continue to, to monitor that. And, you know, that formula that we have right now, we're in the first year of the biennium. You know, next year is the second year. We'll learn this formula and then we'll get a new you know, budget. And I'm sure those we get to do something different. So, you know, about the time we get to monitoring it and get it figured out real well, then, you know, they change it all. They just don't want us to understand it well. No, they really don't. It's not real well, they don't. <laughs> but, so between that real estate being up 967000 and the state foundation being up 873, we're about $1.7 million up in revenue in total. And then our expenditures were underexpended by about 455. So we're about two million to the good right now. Um, and of course, we always project our expenditures a little bit um, conservatively because you don't want to, you know, be over budget. So we do that. Um, and then the uh, amended certificate of estimated resources is we have gotten grants, and the, all we're doing is just make basically making sure we have the funds available and approved from you that matches the revenues that we know we're getting so there's no risk involved and that finalizes my comments yes, thank you any other discussions or anything else no. mr morrison yes Ms. Hunt? yes Ms. arnold yes mr Rana. yes mr taylor yes hey, we're on to new business this time we'll walk through a discussion of this morning. The motion is second to approve on the employment salary changes, leave of absence, and termination on page 33. Um, and the approval of the Green County Educational Service Center contract for fiscal year 2017 services on page 50. The SSA resolution, page 54. And approved good faith offer from the city will be approved for the purchase of two land parcels on page 56. So, fast document offer. If you would just review the SSA resolution for what was in here last month, and also um, the purchase of the two land parcels, which are not 80 acres each. I, I, yeah, that. Uh, we, we a motion and we need are you a motion a second? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. Same thing, kind of okay. Uh, item B, actually, item A, the employee salary changes is somewhat lengthy. As you notice, all the classified individual salary notices are included. That's mandated by law. We, we provide those to our employees on what their salary will be in the next year. So this is part of the process of starting that to inform the employees what their salary will be next year. Item B is the approval of the Green County SC contract for services for 2017 this year. And as I wrote in the notes the services mainly provided by the ESA for children's special needs. And at any given time, we know that in our district we have 10% uh, to 11% to 12% children on IDs. And oftentimes they're very good incidents children that are very difficult to provide services for. And we use the ESC services they provide professionals to come into our buildings and help the children. Also, they provide classrooms outside of our district where we send children for special so this is an annual, <coughs> excuse me, this is an annual approval of <coughs> services with ESC. Then item C is the ESSA resolution. We discussed this last year. We're in a position where the federal government approved the Every Student Succeed Act. And what this resolution indicates is just our, our state legislators let us in the grassroots who are dealing with education on a daily basis have some voices. They work through this 